Thank you, Annette and Jaime, and thank you to all of you. I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to say that in the history of public education, there have been two very important moments when we thought of education as addressing important adaptive challenges. And I'm going to suggest that the idea of building a global curriculum is an opportunity to repeat that moment. So the first moment happened 400 years ago when a Moravian minister, someone who held religious views that were not accepted by many people, someone came and set his house on fire and burned his wife and his two children. And this man, named John Amos Comenius, had the force of spirit to facing the loss of his family ask, why do we do these things to one another? And he said, we do these things because we don't have the means to work our differences in peaceful ways. And he said, we should educate every person so we could have peace in the world. Now, 400 years ago, we didn't know how to do that. We similarly faced that moment at the end of World War II when a group of people meeting in San Francisco asked themselves, why did we just do this to one another? Why did we kill so many people? And again, they said, we did that because we didn't have the conditions that guaranteed every person the right to live with dignity. And they invented what I think is one of the most wonderful creations of humanity, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, a little two-page document, 30 articles, one of which, Article 26, says we should educate every person. Education is a basic right. And that Article 26 says we should do that again so we could have peace in the world. Now, these were two great moments in our history as a common humanity. The global education movement, the movement to educate everybody, which is only 65 years old, very quickly went into autopilot and became instead about getting all the kids to go to school and getting them to learn a few things at low cost so they could all learn them. So I would say we lost the moral vision about why we're educating everybody. But the world keeps changing. And some of the challenges, some of the opportunities that we have, I think of three that are pretty big. The challenge of poverty and inequality and the social exclusion they bring with them, which preclude many people the opportunity to live with dignity and which are at the core of potential serious conflict and instability within societies and between societies. The panel that talked about terrorism just talked about that. The second big challenge is the challenge of relating with our earth, with our environment in a way so that we can pass down an earth that we can live in to our children and grandchildren. Third challenge is the challenge of being able to live in a world where we're all coming together from different religious backgrounds and ethnic backgrounds and see those differences as opportunities, as sources of possibilities, not as threats. Now, these three challenges have everything to do with education. They have everything to do with the reason Comenius argued 400 years ago that we should educate everybody so we could have peace, and they have everything to do with peace. Now, these are adaptive challenges. But the global education movement, particularly of the last 40 years, has really been about trying to get schools to become a little bit better at what they're doing. The last 20 years, we decided that we imported into education an idea that dominated industrial management. And the idea is you can only manage what you can measure. So we found ways to measure some learning outcomes and to hold the education system accountable to those metrics. And we forgot that every exercise in measurement is before anything an exercise in judgment, deciding what to measure. Typically, we measure a few things at low cost. And those systems, those accountability systems, have developed a laser-like focus on a few subjects that develop cognitive skills, typically language, mathematics, and to some extent, science. They don't measure much more than that. I think the reason we should approach the question of how do we rethink curriculum through a design approach is because what we need is to engage in an exercise of imagination, 
of creativity, of imagining what the end would look like, and then figure out the process to get there. And we will not get there through the kinds of tools that enable the management of technical problems. See, there are two kinds of innovations. There is the sustaining innovation that is about getting an existing system to get better at producing that which is, it is producing. And there is the disruptive innovation which is about inventing something that we don't yet know how to do. That is about creating new products. And this is what we're trying to do today, to create a new product. It'd be the wrong way to engage this to begin saying how are we gonna measure? Because we still don't know what it looks like. And so what does it mean to prepare people for peace, to address these challenges? Well, there are certain things that we're gonna have to teach the young. They should understand the process of globalization. They should have religious literacy. They should have intercultural awareness. It was wonderful, yesterday at the reception, I met a person, I don't know where she is, school principal in England, whose first question was, I was asking her about some questions about her job, she said, where are you coming from? I said, Boston. She says, because that'll help me explain things to you in a way you would understand. And I loved it. I said, where did you learn that? I wish everybody had that skill to ask themselves, who am I talking to so I can explain things in a way they can understand. So intercultural awareness and competency, the ability to work in diverse groups and to see that difference as a strength, the capacity to understand the history of the world, or rather the histories, because history is a construction to understand that of the same, sometimes some of the most serious problems we have in the world actually have two historical narratives. And we all need to know the two historical narratives so we can understand the other. We need to understand global risks. We need to be able to imagine future scenarios. We need to know what are these little human rights in those two pages that are the foundation of the existing global order that we have, and what are these institutions that were created to advance human rights, and how do they function? And so, but more than knowledge, we need to also have the caring about these issues, to be motivated to do something about them, and the competency to be able to do something about each of these areas. So when I think about learning, I am adopting a 21st century conception of learning, and I will be in a panel tomorrow where I will say more about that, which is that learning really includes competencies in three big domains. One domain is cognitive. Most education systems think about cognition, and cognition includes knowledge of facts, the capacity to use that knowledge to solve problems, and the capacity to create and innovate, the capacity you're gonna be drawing on today. The second domain, is knowledge of self and the capacity to manage oneself. A certain intellectual openness, the openness we all depended on when we listened to Annette and said, yes, we're ready to do what you're proposing to us, even though it is rather different from the kinds of things we do most days. Flexibility, adaptability, um, responsibility, but also work ethics, the desire to invest ourselves and do our very best when we do whatever it is and also the capacity to regulate ourselves, the capacity to manage ourselves. So that's the second bucket. Third bucket is the capacity to relate with others, to work in teams, to collaborate, and to lead others. So these three buckets are the ways in which we should develop these competencies for young people to not only recognize these risks that I talk about, but to care about them and to have the skills to minimize them. Now, why am I hopeful about what we're gonna to do today? This ambition to develop a curriculum in human rights or in peace studies or environmental sustainability, is not new. What is new is that we have tremendous power in technology to help us build systems that leverage the capacity of individuals and teams to do very, very ambitious things, such as the ones I'm describing. Curriculum is not self-executing. I think it's fine to be talking about curriculum. Curriculum has been all too absent from the global conversation of the last 20 years of the global education reform movement. In fact, some organizations suggested 20 years ago, the World Bank produced a book on what works in advancing education, and they said curriculum is a blind alley. It should not be pursued. We shouldn't bother with it. See, the paradigm was one of how do we help systems become better at doing 
what they are already trying to do, so why bother examining what they're trying to do? It is appropriate that we should ask ourselves what should we teach the kids, especially because technology allows us to support teachers, teams in schools, collectives of teachers, in ways that produce collective intelligence. Let me just end with two examples of what I mean. There are emerging models that allow teachers the opportunity to share their creations about how to teach something, to engage in a collective act of shaping curriculum. This is within reach of anybody who knows how to code. And there are many models of that sort around the world. Now imagine if we could deploy a model of that sort on behalf of building a curriculum of global studies. Imagine, if we, imagine Wikipedia, which is a way to use technology to crowdsource, to engage a large community of people in generating a public good that benefits everybody. Imagine a Wikipedia for global studies, what to teach and how to teach it. So I will end there with great excitement for what awaits us. Thank you. Thank you so much. So much inspiration already. <laughs> um, next, I'd like to welcome, oops, where's my thing? Here we go. John Gugulis, um, who is the Chief Curriculum Officer at GEMS Education in the UAE. And what's really nice, you will notice our three speakers represent three different continents. So thank you for being here. Is that yours, Fernando? That is mine. That's mine. That's, that's there for me to know at a time. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, welcome. Um, my fellow curriculum junkies, I presume you're all curriculum junkies, that's why you're here and not in another session, so this is terrific. Um, I love listening to Fernando. I could listen forever. I'm going to take a slightly different tack uh, in relation to this question. Um, Somebody said to me, two things I've learned. One is, if you don't know the answer to the question, just keep on asking questions. So I might be doing that. I'll ask a few more questions. And somebody else has taught me that over time, if you say things in threes or fours, they're kind of digestible. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say four things today. Uh, and most of them are based around four different questions in relation to this question. My... Uh, experience, the, where I come from in terms of my perspective is, um, and as I reflect on this and think about the challenges and opportunities, apart from my experience in education and curriculum development, I think my last five years before coming to GEMS in developing a, working on a core national curriculum in Australia, K-12, to kind of got me um, thinking about the challenges and opportunities, in fact, experiencing the challenges and opportunities firsthand, albeit in a particular context, but again, you might think a homogeneous context. Well, not really. You know, seven or eight different states and territories, each with their own constitutional responsibility. You've got a multicultural society and you've got an indigenous population, unlike New Zealand, which is you know, many hundreds of dialects and different cultural groups that you're having to deal with as you're thinking through what a core curriculum will be. Uh, and you can translate that into the global situation. So here are the four things based on my, um, my reading of this, what should children learn and thinking about a core curriculum. My first question, um, as I thought this through, is why are we asking this? I mean, who should be asked and who places values on these things? This notion of what kids should learn. Why are we asking the question? I think, and we don't do this, and we didn't do it where I've come from in many years I've been in education, and that is we should be asking these questions ahead of each generation. We should be thinking about our curriculum and what kids should be learning on a regular basis. Uh, learning, schooling, teaching, curriculum has to be dynamic and it has to reflect, I believe, the changes and challenges in society. And too often we leave it too late or too often we leave it to 
a political imperative to change something uh, rather than saying, as a matter of course, let's do it. The question about who should we be asking about what kids should learn, who says this is what they should learn, who places value on this? Um, too often, I don't think we ask students, we don't ask young people, um, and I think we should. I think we should be looking at asking future employment uh, uh, people, business and industry, academics, government. See, I'm not sure on the question of who, and, and again, I'm putting this more as a proposition rather than as a, de a definitive statement. But we go asking subject specialists in the field what they think kids should learn, and guess what they say? The maths people say, lots of maths. And the science people say, really good science, and so on. And that's what you get. No matter, you know, you've been in rooms with any of the subject areas. I'm humanities-based. You get a bunch of history people in the room. They'll tell you about the value of history. Universities. Well, my colleagues in universities, and again, things are changing rapidly in universities, but one of the driving forces for the curriculum at K-12 and the pathways leading through, I think, is about university entrance and university college readiness. It has been up to now, and I know things are changing, but as long as that stays there, what's the point? Every time we go to academics and we ask them, with due respect to all my colleagues, some academics, and we ask them about what is important for kids to learn, it's about their stuff. It's not necessarily about the whole child. It's not necessarily about the kinds of competencies that Fernando referred to. Because if it was, then the assessment criteria, the ways in which kids are selected, would be different, I think. Governments. Our representatives in government, are they the right people we should be asking? I don't know about that. I started in, 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 two, I forget the decade, in 2008 or 9 on the national curriculum, every government in the country, every state government and federal government were Labor. It was a Labor government which was kind of left-leaning. Four years later, as we're about to finish the curriculum, um, most of the governments in the states and territories be had become conservative. The federal government had just changed to a conservative government, and just as we're about to publish this new Butte curriculum, we're going to do a review, says the new government. Based on what? Because somehow they know what kids should learn, and somehow it's different to what Labor thought? No, because they've got to put their imprimatur on this, and so on. Every government does, so I wouldn't go to governments. My kids, their friends and their, and, the, and their generation and the next generation after my kids, they're different young people to me and to my friends. They have come out of a different cultural milieu, a different social and home environment. They're confident people. They're open to new ideas and challenges. They're flexible, they're global in their thinking. You know, my kids from an early age active in their thinking about citizenship, um, currently in their 20s, travelled. They're restless, they're social, they're articulate, they're, they're far different to what I was. They're very connected, they're risk takers. Despite schooling, they're all those things. I don't think schooling contributed a significant um, um, a bit to that, a little bit, but not significant. Um, but, but over time, I think formal schooling and parenting has to keep up and take advantage of the things that Fernando referred to, access to information, choices, social interactions, speed of communications, the whole technology area, the do-it-yourself li lifestyle. The other thing is that there has to be consensus and agreement explicitly stated, both multilateral and multi-partisan, in order for any of this, who places values on these things, to actually get any credence and any movement forward. My second question is to what extent does curriculum matter? You know, uh, this is, uh, you've got to reflect on this as a curriculum person, I reflect on this all the time, and I said to what extent does it actually matter 
that you have a curriculum that does these things or conveys the important things about learning that maybe go beyond traditional discipline areas. A core curriculum does matter, but I think only as a frame and a guide that aligns our practices. There is such thing as an informal curriculum, and I know that in schools and in other places, that tends to be sometimes more influential. Um, we would all agree, maybe, that in the early years, a core curriculum should focus on literacies and numeracy and social development and physical development. Um, it's critical. In the later years, there's the traditional disciplines versus the 21st century competencies, the personal, social, and cognitive domains of competencies. I don't think it's a that or that. I think it's both. Somebody in the panel this morning talked about the deep learning that needs to take place both in discipline areas and, and also in competency areas. It's not one or the other. We shouldn't put it up like that. But I think for both deep learning and pedagogy, we need um, a curriculum, and a curriculum can only be exciting when it's actually enacted. Um, I haven't seen any curriculum documents that excite me. Uh, and where there's great learning and teaching materials and great teachers. Is that your way of saying? Okay. The second and third um, uh, questions for me are the how, when, and where of learning. Um, you do need personalised learning, multiple learning environments um, in different settings. Uh, social settings, collaborative, and student-centred as well as online. Um, one thing that I think for me is really important, and it's my la going to be my last point, and that is from whom um, should, they, should, should this learning take place? Um, there's the question about independently, at home, uh, with peers, uh, with a teacher, with an online tutor, with the role of the teacher is cr critical in this process. Um, I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's a combination of these things. And what's important is that young people do need significant adults who know and understand them and are able to mentor them and guide them and advise them. And we can all think of someone like that in our lives. Um, but teachers and adults need to be tuned and skilled to be able to do that. There is no point in talking about the development of these significant competencies if the teachers or the adults in our young people's lives don't actually know how to, how to engage students in this, how to teach them these things, how to advise them about these things. So that's critical. And I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you so very much, John. Lastly, let's welcome Michael O'Sullivan, who is joining us from the UK. Michael is the Chief Executive at Cambridge International Examinations at the University of Cambridge. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me five minutes of your time. Um, Cambridge International Examinations is part of the University of Cambridge, and I'm even more honoured to be representing Europe as a continent in our discussion today. Um, our previous Vice-Chancellor used to like to say there are very few institutions in Europe that are 800 years old, um, and very few of those are still useful. Uh, I think that's a very good insight. We think we're still useful at Cambridge uh, because we're not afraid to challenge the way things are done, because we're very committed to innovation based on a an evidence base. Um, and we identify strongly as Cambridge International Examinations with those principles. We are currently providing curriculum from age five to age 19 to schools um, in about 180 countries worldwide, so most countries. We are embedded in the state systems of countries as diverse as Singapore and Mauritius. We are working with private education in every continent. Um, the region we're in now is a particularly busy one for us, but that's enough by way of introduction. I want to take a sort of design angle on this and just address some questions of, if you wanted to build a world curriculum, and some of us have tried and been trying for a while, what, what would be in it and why? What, what, what would it consist of? And I want to address questions of language, levels, content, culture, 
and briefly skills and pedagogy, and then leave you with a, a question exercise as I was asked to do. Let's knock one question on the head first. Um, can we speak of a world curriculum that's only delivered through English? Clearly, if we want to be ambitious, no, we can't. Uh, the world does not speak English, although an increasing number of people learn it as a second language or a foreign language. Um, can we have a single useful world curriculum represented in many different language media? Well, this is very debatable and very interesting. Our own experience, we worked with a few countries to switch part of their curriculum by taking our standard international one and translate it. So we're doing that currently in Kazakhstan, in Macedonia, in a few places. Our experience is you can do it up to a point, but you have to make a lot of adaptation beyond pure translation in order to have something acceptable and useful in those different language contexts. So you need to decide what are you aiming for? Is it a, a world curriculum deliverable through English or is it a world curriculum? Second, the issue of levels, by which I mean levels of attainment. Who is this curriculum for? Now in the last 10 days, I've been in two countries in particular, Egypt and Pakistan, where the difference of attainment between children of any age um, in the system as a whole, the wider system, those who are even in it, and those in the, say the top 5% that go to well-organized schools of the kind many of you work in is enormous, considerably bigger in the, than in my own country where, where it's not small. So sure, when we, when we listen to Andreas this morning, we see how much change is possible, how much improvement we want. But we have to be realistic. Can we really build a single set of levels, a single assessment framework, and try and deliver it to the world? Do we need to tier the qualifications? How do we begin to address that huge gap? Since clearly what we are envis envisaging is a leveling up at least, and not a, not a leveling down or a meeting in the middle around levels of attainment. Content. Which subjects fit? Which subjects belong in a core curriculum? It's probably easy to agree on maths, some kind of science curriculum, possibly some more recent uh, notions of curriculum, such as critical thinking. Um, is English part of a world curriculum? Should it be an optional subject? It's really hard to stipulate common content in the humanities. And should we even try? Can we make universal claims about curriculum balance? Should every child study science and humanities up to a certain level? Who should decide that? Should we standardize local subjects? So for example, we set standard Cambridge qualifications in subjects like Pakistan studies and Bahasa Indonesia. Obviously, they're mainly taken in just one country, but you can still standardize the design of the syllabus and the assessment design if you think that's a, a useful thing to do. Culture. Surely education both reflects and shapes identity and culture. And yet we all have different cultures and different identities. So the curriculum must and will surely have national and local personality, even where it includes some global features. So where is the space for those in a world curriculum? Can we build a useful common curricula dimension around citizenship or global citizenship or common humanity and values? And how do we negotiate what those common values or principles are without trespassing on the national or the faith domain of, of different traditions? Should we worry less about content, moving on to skills, and define the world curriculum primarily as a skills-based curriculum, and then just rely on the washback effect to direct choice of content specific to the context. I think when we talk about content in the curriculum, an analogy I think of is the British Museum, but you could say the same of any of the world's great museums and galleries. You go in there and you think, gosh, what a lot of marvelous stuff. 
But if you know about how the institution works, you know that probably only 10% or 5% of the collection is ever on display at any time, and the rest is hidden from sight. The potential curriculum in any subject is far bigger than can be delivered in any context. Indeed, some of the weakest national curriculum systems exhibit a feature which I would call content overloading. There's too much there, too much in the textbook, too much testing, therefore, of memorization of facts in assessments, all having rather negative effects on the progress of learners. And then finally, pedagogy. Can we use a, a world curriculum to embed a, a dominant pedagogy that has a right to be dominant? Now, this sounds dangerously imperialist, and yet I'm quite sympathetic to it. I'm being very honest with you. Um, last week in Egypt, at a state school where we've worked to introduce as an experiment a different way of teaching Arabic to Egyptians. All Egyptians study Arabic, not surprisingly. Uh, in state schools, it's one of the least liked, most boring subjects with extremely poor attainment and consequently a lot of worry about Arabic literacy in the population as a whole. If you just take our approach, and it could be the approach of any of the other major curriculum providers or any, the sort of thing any of you would do if you were asked to fix Arabic in an Egyptian state school, learner-centered approaches, communicative approaches, interesting curricular material, a focus on skills. Any of you could do it, or half the people in this room. We've done it just in a handful of schools. Suddenly, Arabic's the most popular subject. The teachers think it's much more fun teaching this way. So I'm rather persuaded by, by the idea that actually embedding um, a better pedagogy or pedagogies might be one of the most attractive features of a world curriculum, possibly more important than the specific content and skills that you uh, declare to be universally valid. So my key question is, a, is, like any Cambridge exam question, it's very carefully crafted, so you can demonstrate a variety of skills. And it is this, in defining a world curriculum, what is the order of importance of these different features? Defining the core subjects, defining standard content within each subject, declaring what a model pedagogy or pedagogies are, defining the skills that are supposed to be attained, defining the assessment strategy, how you're going to assess it, and defining ethical or values norms within the curriculum. That's quite challenging. And within those categories, what can you actually standardize? And indeed, should any of the above not be standardized within a world curriculum? Thank you very much.